All right. Now, the subject matter I'm going to be preaching on this morning, the name of my sermon is called Religious Extremism. And this is kind of a, a hot topic today in, in today's world. Now, we are talking about this. We hit on this slightly before service, um, just, just in conversation. But I believe there's, a, there's an agenda going on, and the media is involved. And, and, you know, do I know exactly who is promoting this agenda? Ultimately, it's Satan. Ultimately, you know, there's, there's, there's powers that be. There's dark powers and high places. You know, the Bible warns us about this. There's a God of this world that's not the Lord, the little G God, the devil. And there's a lot of talk, and you know, we were just talking about this briefly before service. You hear a lot of talk about the terrorism, and the, you know, then they start introducing domestic terrorism. They start getting people used to these concepts, and you hear these words, you get bombarded over and over and over and over again. And they want you to think a certain way about it. And before you even really heard, you know, terrorism kind of went hand, goes hand in hand with extremism, right? You hear these extremists, and they'll, they'll use these words interchangeably. They'll say these, these extremists, these terrorists, these extremists, these Muslim extremists, these Muslim terrorists. And, you, and you'll start getting you to associate these two words as if they mean the same thing. Now, I'll tell you right now this morning, I am an extremist. I am a Christian extremist. And what I think we need to understand is that the word extreme is not a bad word. It's not a negative word. It doesn't mean that you're a terrorist. Being extreme, hey, that means you're all for one thing. You are all on one side of something. When we have, for example, the Bible, the truth. Truth is the truth. Truth is very extreme. Anything contrary to truth is wrong. So if you have something that's true, it is true. With the Bible, there's no shades of gray. There's no uncertainty. Now, we may have some uncertainty as to what the Bible is saying, but God's word and his truth, it is what it is. It's white. It's light. It is. It is has no darkness in it whatsoever. See, shades of gray, what is it? It's white with some darkness in it, right? The Bible is light. And in the truth, there is no darkness whatsoever. There is no shades of gray with the truth. And I believe 100% in the truth and in the word. And it's an extreme position to take, especially in today's society. You have a lot of people that will say, oh, I don't have have a problem with Christianity so much. I mean, you know, basically they'll say, yeah, you know, know, there are are people out there that, that aren't Christians. But they'll say, well, I don't really have too much of a problem. If you want to use the Bible, they'll make up their own terms, their own submission. Well, if you want to use the Bible to kind of help make you a better person and to help other people out, then I don't have a problem with that. But they'll go on further to say, but there's definitely things in the Bible that aren't right and that you shouldn't be, you know, like that, that they don't want to hear and they don't like, you know, the negative aspects. The things that are, that, that don't suit their worldview and their beliefs. You know, usually about sin and about God's punishment for sins and about, you know, well, you know, I don't I don't think that adulterers should be put to death. I mean, that's pretty extreme. It is extreme. In today's world, it's considered extreme. But according to God, it's just the truth. It's just pure wisdom. It's just it's just right. It's just the right thing that, that ought to be done. Just like anything that we find in the Bible. And this is, this is just truth and righteousness. And what we started off here in Hebrews chapter 1. Look at verse number 9. Well, look at verse number 8. But unto the Son he saith, this is God speaking to Jesus Christ. But unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Look at this. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Because Jesus Christ loved righteousness. I mean, he was all for it. He loved righteousness. But he hated iniquity. With a pure hatred. had nothing to do with sin and wickedness and iniquity. For that reason, it says, you know, God basically has exalted Jesus Christ. And this is, this is two extremes, right? 
loving something and hating the other. And we're going to look at some different examples of, of hate in the Bible and love in the Bible. We're going to get those two extremes. Because they're extreme opposites. They're polar opposites, right? Just like on a magnet, you've got, you've got the two poles on a magnet in the earth. We've got the North Pole and the South Pole. Those are two extremes, right? Love and hatred are two extremes. We should have the extremism of both. We need to have extreme hatred. We'll get to that and we'll go over what the extreme hatred is for. And we need to have the extreme love. And this is what God wants us to have. So if you want to label me, and you know what? The me is going to have no problem saying yes. Word of Truth Baptist Church is extremist. <laughs> But see, the problem is that what you have to watch out for is the propaganda and, and the mind control and the brainwashing that they're going to do is, is try to equate extremism with terrorism, equate extremism with, with just being bad and being wrong. There's nothing wrong with extremely loving God and extremely loving His words. People try to tell you that's wrong. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's actually a good thing. It's actually what God wants from you. Let's start off with salvation. Salvation is pretty extreme. Pretty extreme. Look at uh, I'll have, you guys. Turn to Psalm ninety-seven while while I'm going into the salvation. We're all probably familiar with the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, right? We show this out to people at the door, talking about baptism because Acts eight thirty-seven is removed from from all the modern versions perversions of the Bible. And I'll just I'll read it for you. Acts eight thirty six says, and as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Saying, Hey, look. There's some water. I want to be baptized. Why can't I be baptized? And verse 37, this is the verse that's removed, says, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He says, wait, 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 before you get baptized, before you can you know, do this, this symbol, show that you are a believer in Christ, you have to believe with all your heart. And notice he says, If thou believest with all thine heart. That's pretty extreme. He's like, oh, I'll just believe a little bit. No, you have to believe on Christ with all of your heart. 100%. You are believing on Jesus Christ alone. It's not like some people want to do, well, I believe in Jesus, but you know, I've got to at least live a pretty good life in order to make it to heaven. That's, you're starting to mix things together here. You're starting to say, well, it's not all just Jesus. Well, I've got to, at least, I mean, I've got to be baptized, right? I, gotta, I, can't, I can't murder someone. If I do that, I'm going to lose my salvation, right? No, look. Salvation through Christ is believing on Him with all of your heart. It means you're not trusting in yourself whatsoever. You can't, you can't have a little bit of everything. It's extreme. You have to just be, you know what? It's 100% Jesus. He paid for all of my sins, every single one of them, and I am only resting in Him. I'm only trusting in His grace. That's extreme. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He says, He is the way, the truth, and the life. That's it. He is the way. There is, there is no other way. You get, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, well, that's, that's extreme. What do you mean? That's real exclusive. That means you can only... What about all these other people that, that believe in these Eastern religions and, the, and that are Hindu? I mean, there's billions of people over there. What about them? What about these people who believe in, in, uh, in um, you know, the Muslim faith? What about them? Jesus is extreme. He says, I am the way. He says, nobody comes to the Father but by me. It's extreme. But it's the truth. I'm a fanatic this morning. And I don't have any problem being called it. Just because people have a negative connotation with that, I have no problem saying, Pastor Burzens is a fanatic. I think every word of God is pure, and I literally believe every word to be true. Now look at Psalm 97, verse 10. Hate is what is one extreme that I was bringing up earlier. Hate is an extreme. Look at Psalm 97, verse 10. Ye that love the Lord, hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. You don't have to turn to all these. Well, turn if you would to Psalm 119. We're going to look at a, a few verses from there. So the Bible says in Psalm 97 to hate evil. We ought to hate that which is evil, which is bad, which is wicked. Look at Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is a bit the longest chapter in the Bible. It deals with um, God's law. 
in like every verse, you, you have all these great verses about God's love. Psalm 119, we're going to start in verse 104. We see different references to things that we need to hate. So we saw to hate evil. Psalm 104, 119, verse 104. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Every way of untruth, every way that's not the right way. And, and we saw Jesus Christ is the way, right? There's one right way, which means every other way is false. He's saying, I hate every other way. Jesus is the only way that I love, and I'm going to hate every other way. I'm not going to say, well, I just like him a little bit less. That's not hatred. When you have hate for something, it's not, well, I'd rather have something else. Oh, I don't really like it so much. No, when you hate it, you want to have nothing to do with it. Look at verse 113. I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. Hating thoughts that are studio, vain thoughts that are good for nothing. I mean, va- vanity can be a lot of different things, right? Things that you do in your life that don't really matter. Things, things that that you're thinking about that have no consequence whatsoever. They're vain. So I'm, I'll look at verse one twenty seven. Therefore, I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. There's one extreme, loving it above you know the the most money that you can get. Hey, I love God's commandments. More than I love, you know, the, the most riches that I could have in this world. That's extreme love. Com- contrasted with 128, verse 128, Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. Again, and then verse 163, he says, I hate and abhor lying, but thy law do I love. Now, it is very important in your life to have the proper hatred. Another agenda that's being pushed today is tolerance. Now, if you hate something, can you really hate something and also be tolerant of it at the same time? No. When you hate it, you want to, like I said, you have nothing to do with it. It's wrong. It's wicked. Get it out of here. The tolerance is saying, oh, well, yeah, that's okay. You know, it may not be something I'm going to do, but it's okay. I'm going to tolerate it. It's fine. The Bible says when there's things that we need to hate, we don't tolerate it. We don't just allow it and say, and, you know, and, and this is one of the problems I have with the television. Let's turn, if you would, to Psalm uh, 101. It's just because it's a big avenue to get agendas across, to make you think a certain way. The media, the music, you know, all these different different tools that Satan uses to get into your brain and make you think certain way about things. He uses the, the visual, he uses the audio, he uses, you know, not even just movies and, and those things, but even the news. As I was bringing up earlier, just right, you say, well, what's wrong with watching the news? Well, they're feeding you a particular agenda. They're telling you what to think about. They're telling you how we ought to be viewing things. And, and they're bringing up and doing these word associations when it comes to extremism, when it comes to terrorism and all this other stuff. And they're trying to get you to think a certain way about what's happening in this world. <clears throat> When you start to tolerate sin in every false way, and you start to think, well, you know, that's fine if you want to do that. No, it's not fine. If it's, if it's wickedness, if the Bible says it's wrong, if, 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 if it's not something we should be doing, you know, fornication, adultery, these things. Hey, if it's wickedness, it's wickedness. And we shouldn't just tolerate it. But see, the world's going to try to tell you and give you all the backstory on things and tell you why, oh, you need to feel sorry for this person and why they're in this situation and why they're sinning and why all these things. Look, if I'm going to hate the wicked way, I'm not going to tolerate it whatsoever. You start making excuses for sin is when, you, is, is when the tolerance comes in. We can't make any excuses. Look at Psalm 101, verse number 2. Actually, we just, I only copied verse number two. I'll start reading in verse number one. There's no reason not to read it. We'll read the whole thing. And I've gone over this in the past, but it's always good to go over this again. Psalm 101 will probably be our next memory verse. This is going to be a great one to have memorized if you don't have it already. Psalm 101, verse one. I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Hey, being perfect, that's pretty extreme. 
I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. So he's setting the scene here. When I'm at home, when I'm walking around at home, I'm going to walk in my house with a perfect heart. You know, when you're out in the world, sometimes it's a little bit easier to have the influence of people. You know, things come in front of your eyes or you you get put into situations where it it, it might be easier to not have a perfect heart out in the world. But at least he's like, in my house, I'm going to walk within my house with a perfect heart. I'm going to make sure there's not other things to distract me and other things to tempt me into sin within my own house. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 3. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. That's not having tolerance for wicked things. He's saying, I am not going to set this before my eyes. I'm not going to decorate my house, for example, with idols. I'm not going to have the little Buddha just there because, oh, I think it's cute. Or someone gave this to me as a gift or whatever. Look, that's not going to be in my house. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. That's one example. Another example, I think, is is sitting in front of the, the, the TV screen and watching the Hollywood movies that are promoting filth and wickedness and sodomy and everything else. Hey, I'm not going to set that before my eyes. I'm not going to allow myself to be, to be programmed in that way and set these wickedness before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. See, the wicked doers out there, the more you look on them, the, the, the actors and actresses and rock stars, and you look on them and you look on them, it's going to start cleaving and rubbing off on you. It's going to influence you. You say, look, that, that's not going to cleave to me. I have nothing to do with that garbage. I'm not going to set that before my eyes. Verse 4, a forward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. The wicked people, those are my friends. Now, I'll go out to the wicked to try to get them saved, but I'm not going to know them. I am not going to be good friends with wicked people. I'm going to separate myself from the world. I'm going to live differently. Verse 5, Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. So what, who, what's this talking about? The person who's privately, that's what privily is, they're slandering his name, they're speaking bad about other people. The people who are just bad-mouthing other people behind their back, talking bad about them, he says, I'm going to cut them off. I'm not going to have anything to do with them either. You're going to sit here and just talk bad about other people and rail on other people and just talk about them behind their back? I'm not going to talk to you. And the Bible series about this too, about people who are backbiters and people who, who go around and, and they have nothing else to do but get involved in other people's business. Busy bodies. We ought to have nothing to do with those people. That is wickedness and that is sin, just going around and talking about other people. He says, Him will I cut off. Him that hath a high look and a proud heart will not I suffer. Even just, just spending a bunch of time. Look, if, when you spend your time around these types of people, it will rub off on you. That's what I said. It's not going to cleave to me. When, when people start talking about other people, it's a lot easier to get involved in that conversation. The Bible says to give them a, a nasty look. And let them know when someone comes to you and just wants to, to spread gossip about other people, give them a bad look. And just, just, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about that. There's no point to it. And having the proud heart, just being real haughty in spirit, guess what? That's going to rub off on you. Don't, he says, I'm not going to suffer it. I'm not going to allow it. It's not going to be allowed in my house, in my presence. I will not have that. Verse number six, mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. Now he's talking about good people. He's saying, look, these are the people I want to have around the faithful of the land. The people who love God. This is who I want to dwell with me and spend my time with. Verse 7, He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. I will early destroy all the wicked of the land that I may cut off all wicked doers from the city of the Lord. He's taking an extreme stance. He's saying, I want to have nothing to do with this. I don't want to get mixed up in your sins. I don't want to get mixed up with the proud. I don't want to get mixed up with the gossipers and busybodies. I don't want to get mixed up with the liars. I will not know a wicked person. I'm going to spend my time with the faithful of the land. Turn if you would to Mark chapter 12. Mark 12. 
Mark chapter 12. The proper hatred will help you to not get involved in the sins to begin with. That's the, that is the number one reason for having the hatred for the wickedness is so that you don't get mixed up in it yourself. Every single time people sin, I believe, the people that know better, and I think everyone in this room probably knows better. You've read enough Bible, you've gone to enough church to know the difference between right and wrong from the Bible. You've seen it for yourself. And when people get involved in sin, it's because, one, they have their own lust and their own temptation. But you always will make an excuse for it. Why is it okay? Why is it okay to, to talk bad about this person in this situation? Why, why is that okay now? People will always come up with a reason. Why is it okay to, to gossip about people? Well, it's okay because you, you need to know about this. You know, look, no, you don't. The Bible talks about the, the words that come out of our mouth should be for edification and, and should be for good. You know, can, uh, can, does a fountain bring forth sweet water and bitter? It says in James. You know, and it says, you know, out of the mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. How can these things be? You know, you should be cursing other people. You know, it, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's not what your mouth is designed for. So, um, but people always try to bring up a justification for their sin and doing what they're doing. If you have the proper hatred for that sin, there is no justification for it. You say, you know what? I hate fornication. I hate adultery. I hate drinking alcohol. I hate these things. I'm not going to say, oh, well, you know, I'm really saying people will do this with, like, with drinking alcohol. Well, I'm, I'm real sad. I've got a heavy heart. Someone died. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just in this situation. Or, or there's this celebration. There's this wedding. And I'm just going to have some wine this time. And they try to justify that. Hey, if you have the proper hatred of drunkenness, if you have the proper hatred of, of you know, your eyes uh, beholding strange women and your heart uttering perverse things, as Proverbs says about alcohol. If you if you hate that stuff, you're gonna have, you're gonna stay ten feet. You're gonna stay as far away from that stuff as possible. See, I'm not have anything to do with it. I'm not gonna make up some excuse and give some reason why I think this is okay. I hate that. I'm, it's not gonna cleave to me. I want nothing to do with it. I don't want my life to be destroyed. I want to do what's right. You in Mark chapter 12, we're going to see the, the, the opposite extreme. The loving end. Right? That's the hating end. We need to hate the wickedness and hate the bad things. Hate the evil. Hate the sin. Hate all of that. Hate it and, and stay away from it. Train yourself to just have the hatred for it so that when you do see it somewhere, just be like, oh man. Because what happens is people get desensitized too. There used to be a lot more people in this world that hated sodomy and thought it was disgusting and weird and perverted and gross and that only pedophiles and these serial killers are are people who who were sodomites. And that's true, by the way. I've seen enough of those, those documentaries on serial killers. They're all sodomites. They're all of them. They're all perverts. Why? Because they're reprobate. Because they've been given up and given over to the reprobate mind. It's not a coincidence. But slowly, over time, what's been happening is this desensitization process of you being exposed to a particular sin. And in this case, so I'm talking about sodomy. Just being exposed, being exposed. So it wears you down to try to, to wear your hatred down. Because it's not... Hate, I mean, hating isn't a fun feeling, right? It's not, it's not something that you just enjoy. Like, you just enjoy hating things. And, but we ought to. I mean, in order, in order to keep ourselves pure and keep our minds right and keep everything else pure, we need to have this proper hatred. If you see something like the, the wickedness, it be like, get that out of here. I don't want that in front of my eyes. And if you're going to try putting that in front of my eyes again, I'm, I'm going to make sure I never see it again. But see, too many people, they don't want to take that extreme step. Like, we don't have cable. We don't watch television. I fully monitor the things that do come, come into our house when it comes to media. I have no problem taking the extreme step of saying, you know, if it needs be, if, if wickedness ever started coming to my house again, if anyone in my family starts to get involved with things and look at things they shouldn't be looking at, I'll take that stinking TV or computer or whatever the device is that, where that wickedness is coming in and I'll, I'll trash it and throw it in the garbage can in a heartbeat. I'll have no problems with it. 
But we need to have that proper hatred of the sin and just say, I'm not going to allow this. I'm not going to allow the, the, the little influences that come in the, to, the, to the kids' programs that, oh, well, this is, you know, it's not too bad. At least most of it's good. Look, I hate all of it, all the sin and the wickedness. I'm not going to allow any little bit to get into their minds. But let's look at the love aspect. Mark 12, verse 29. And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. God wants all of your attention and love and focus on Him. It's extreme. God is a jealous God. God doesn't want you going to anybody else. He wants you going only to Him and directly to Him. He says, I want all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. That's the first commandment. The first and the greatest. God wants everything. And that's extreme. But we ought to look at that and say, well... I'm going to extremely love my God. I'm going to give Him all of my heart. I'm going to give Him, I'm going to love God with all of my strength and my soul and my might. And if I love God, what am I going to do? I'm going to listen to what He has to say. I'm going to listen to His commandments. I'm going to try to please Him and do what's right in His eyes. If I love Him this way. If I love Him this extremely. (coughs) I'll read for you from Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy 6 is where Jesus Christ was quoting from here. That that commandment was given to love the, love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Deuteronomy ten twelve says, And now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in... No, it doesn't say in some of His ways. In all of His ways. And to love Him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. To keep the commandments of the Lord and His statutes which I command thee this day for thy good. This is what God requires of us. This is what God expects of us. Loving God with all of your heart. It's a decision that you only you can make for yourself. How much are you going to love God? And you know, this is why I'm called extreme. Because I do love God with all my heart. As much as is possible. I, am I perfect? No. Of course I still sin. But this is why even before pastoring, I made a decision, hey, I love God and I want to please God. I want to know as much about the Bible as I can. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to every church service. Every time the church has its doors open, I'm going to be there. Sounds kind of extreme, right? Like, wow, you mean you go to church more than once a week? You go to church more than just on Sunday morning? You better believe I do. I love God. I want to know as much about Him as possible. Every week, going out soul winning, not missing the soul winning time, going out and preaching the gospel of the lost. Hey, I love that. Is that pretty extreme? Yeah, are there things that you have to give up in order to do that? Yes, but I love God, and I want to serve Him. I want to do what's right. We used to go in in my former church. We would go out and do these small town soul winnings. Hey, I made it a point to go to every single one of those events. There's only one that I missed because I had a, a one of my daughters was born. But every other one... I attend it every time. And look, this isn't this isn't this isn't to, to lift myself up, but look, I am a leader in this church. And even the Apostle Paul said, Hey, follow me as I follow Christ. So the examples that I'm giving you here today are just about my personal life is saying, look, if I'm able to do these things, you are too. I was doing these things before I ever became a pastor, before I even thought about becoming a pastor. Why? Because I love God. Because I love Him with all my heart and I'm trying to love Him with all my strength and soul and spirit and might to do what's pleasing to Him. Because I want to know as much about Him as possible. I want to do the work that He's laid out before me. And we all ought to have that same type of love. And to serve Him every day. Not just on Sunday morning. Not just when it's time to go to church. But every day of our life. Pick up the Bible and start reading it. I don't want to serve Him just a little. I think God is worth way more than that anyways. God is worth more than our leftovers. And you say, well God, i got this to do. I've got that to do. I've got all these other things to do. I've got people, I've got other things going on in my life. But I'll set aside ten minutes a week for you God. I'm not giving God my leftovers. 
God gets the first. Think about in your own life, how much time are you spending in God's Word? Reading His Word. I mean, hey, it's going to take your own sacrifices in other areas of your life to make the time to read the instruction of the Lord. And we saw in Psalm 119, there's many references to loving God's commandments. Love, do you really love God's commandments? If you do, are you getting in His Word and reading what they are? And being refreshed about these things and saying, no, I really do love the law of the Lord. And I'm going to meditate on this scripture. I'm going to read it. I'm going to memorize it. I'm going to get it in my heart every day. I'm going to pray. I'm going to come to church. I'm going to do all these things because I love God. The Christian life is meant to be extreme. It's the way God intended it. And the only reason it's even called extreme is because we're comparing it to the world. Right? This really should just be normal. What I'm preaching today is normal in God's eyes. In God's views, hey, this, is, this should be the norm. But because it's relative, those words that we use, normal and extreme, it has to do with, with, the, with the relative of, of, of everybody in this world or everybody that's out there. We are on an extreme end. In God's view, it's normal. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 17. We're just going to get a few examples of Christians in the Bible, in the New Testament, and how they live and how they serve the Lord. It's funny, every once in a while I'll turn on talk radio in my drive, because i got a long drive to go into work. Usually I listen to the Bible for, for a long time, but after a while of listening to the Bible, you kind of, sometimes I get to the point where I can't really, it's, it's so heavy that I can't really handle that much more, so I'll have to turn it off for a while, take a break, and I'll turn on news, you know, like talk radio. And every time it's like they're always pushing the thing that, uh, they'll, they'll try to bring up different sides of a story and they'll say, well, the truth is, like always, somewhere in the middle. Right? They're always trying to tell you, oh, there's these extremists over here and these extremists over here, but you know, the truth is kind of somewhere in the center. And that's where they try to push, even with politics and everything. You know, we've got these crazy right wingers, right? These extreme right wingers and these extreme, you know, liberals. But, you know, the truth is just somewhere in the middle. Let's just be reasonable about it. Let's be rational about it. I don't believe that for a second. You know, as I mentioned earlier, there's no shades of gray in the Bible. The Bible is the truth. There's no in the middle. Well, you know, when the Bible says that you know people should be put to death for committing certain sins, well, you know that's pretty extreme. I don't really, I don't really believe that. Well, then you don't believe God's word. The law of the Lord is perfect. The Bible says, converting the soul. And that, you know, that is one of the problems. If we would have the righteous judgment, and this is a little bit of a, of a sidetrack, if we had righteous judgment in our society today, there would be less wickedness and crime. Because the law of the Lord is perfect, the Bible says converting the soul. See, the law was given to us as a schoolmaster to show us that we're wicked and to show us that we need a Savior and to show us that we need God. And the same way that God's law does that, those laws need to be applied to society and to say, hey, look, adultery is so wicked of a sin, it's so bad that it deserves the death penalty that, that the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And you get the wickedness out of your society that way. And I've mentioned this before, but it's, it's as true as a day is long. If people had a concept that, hey, if I do this, I might lose my life, they might think twice about cheating on their spouse instead of just making up excuses as to why it's okay for them because, well, my wife doesn't love me anyway, so my husband never spends time with me and all these other things. And they start spending time with other men before you know it, they're committing adultery. For one, they don't hate the sin. And two, we don't have, even have the proper laws to show this is extremely wicked. Hey, sodomy is extremely wicked. Now they're teaching kids, oh, well, maybe you're gay. Maybe you grow, you know, maybe, who knows? Why don't you try everything out? That's what they're pumping into the public schools, what our kids are learning today. Because nobody seems to have a problem. Oh, it's just alternative. It's just, it's just another way to live, being a pervert.
No, if we had the law, God's laws in place, the world would be a better place. But let's look at let's look at the way these Christians live. Look at look at Acts sixteen or seventeen, excuse me, Acts seventeen, verse number five. This is people talking about the apostles, talking about the disciples and what they were doing. Acts seventeen, verse five. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company. And set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. So here you get a big mob, basically an angry, wicked, that's why it says people of the baser sort, people who are lower, the people who are, who are more wicked. They get this mob together, they assault the house of Jason, they come to this guy's house, and they're basically demanding to bring these guys out of here. And look at what they say in verse 6, who are these people they're looking for? And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. That's the life of a Christian. When it's said about you, you're turning the world upside down. They're making such an impact. Why? Because they're doing work for the Lord. They're going out every day. Daily in the temple and every house. They ceased not. They didn't quit. They ceased not to preach and teach the Lord Jesus. There's no stopping to keep going and say, this is important. I love God with all my heart and I am going to bring the message of the gospel and you know what? It's going to turn the whole world upside down. And would to God, our world today could be turned upside down because it's already on its head. We need to get things back right again. People are calling evil good and good evil these days. <clears throat> we need to turn this world back. You know what? It's going to make some people upset. It's going to make the wicked upset. It's going to make the pervert upset. It's going to make the baser people upset. And they're going to come and demand it to be stopped. And that's going to make us even shout it from the rooftops even louder. Or it ought to. Don't let these, these loud mouths back you down. You need to come back even stronger. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Turn if you would to Romans chapter 12. Turn if you would to Romans 12. I'm going to read through this little list of uh, the Apostle Paul gave in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Where he was saying that um, you know if, if anybody if anybody thinks that, that they're basically doing God's, God's work, um, he's like, me, I, I'm doing more. And he's saying, like, I speak as a fool, but he's trying to illustrate a point. The people were, were kind of asking, well, who is Paul? You know, who is this guy? 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. So now he's going to go through this whole list of all the things that he's been through. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. And a stripe is called a stripe, not because it's paint, because it's your blood that comes out from your skin, from the wound that you receive when you get whipped. It's a stripe. Five times he was beaten 39 times to where his body just was receiving these wounds. He says, thrice was I beaten with rods. Getting beat up with rods three times. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. Can you imagine just being out in the ocean just or in the sea just, just for a whole night and a day just, just treading water and trying to float and stay alive? In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. And we could go through each one of these individually and actually think about how... how terrible of an experience that would be for you to go through even one of these things, even getting whipped once for 39 times. I mean, just receiving 39 whips, scourgings. And he had it five times. All of this was for the cause of Christ. All of these things he did was the way because he lived his life in a way that he was turning the world upside down by preaching the truth of Jesus Christ loudly and boldly and to everybody that he could. 
He didn't treat this as something that he did on the weekend. He didn't treat this as something he did, well, every once in a while, I'll, I'll give God a bone and I'll do something for him. He says, I'm going to serve God with all of my heart and all of my soul and all of my might. And if, and if anyone's going to try to stop me by whipping me, I'm going to keep doing it. He went through all of these things. This is extreme Christianity, but that's the Apostle Paul. Can only think about the rewards that that, that man has, has laid up for him. If one man can do a lot. Don't ever forget that. You may be surrounded by people who aren't doing very much for God. Don't let that bring you down. And don't get caught up in their lack of, of doing things for God. Hey, keep your mind set on the prize for the high calling. We can do a lot for God. And I know we will do a lot for God. You have to love Him with all of your heart. You're in Romans chapter 12. I love this verse. Romans chapter 12, verse number 1. We're going to close with this. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He's saying your body should be a living sacrifice. Obviously, he doesn't want you putting your body up on the altar and burning it. He's why he calls you a living sacrifice, not a burnt sacrifice. Your body is a living sacrifice unto God. And you know what he says about that? He says, if you do this, you won't be like anybody else. And God is just going to praise you so much. He says, no, that's your reasonable service. It's reasonable to expect that you should yield your body up a living sacrifice unto God and be perfect. He's saying, just doing that, that's reasonable. That's not extreme. That's reasonable. That's rational. That's... Well, that makes perfect sense. Why does that make perfect sense? Because your Savior bought you with His precious blood. Jesus Christ saved your soul from an eternity of hell. It only makes sense that you should offer up yourself and say, God, you saved me. Thank you. I love you. I want to serve you now because you are so loving and gracious unto me. What can I do for you? Whatever you ask of me is not going to be too much. I can't just think about myself and all the things that I want, God, because you saved a wretch like me from going to hell. I'm here. Use me the way that you have laid out for me, God. I love you and want to serve you. That's reasonable. That's reasonable to offer unto the Savior. That's our reasonable service. It's not, it's not extreme. The world... The world's going to call that extreme. Fanatics. You, you go out and like knock on people's doors and you, you, know, you, you, you go to church multiple times a week and you read your Bible every day. What are, you, what are you nuts? No, I love God. And that's it. And don't, don't, don't let this world deceive you into thinking that you're nuts. You're not nuts. You're nuts according to them. That's fine. They call evil good. I don't, I don't want to be called normal by them, by their standards. I want God to look down at me and be pleased with what I'm doing. And hopefully you do too. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the encouragement that we get, for these great stories of people have done great things for you, dear Lord. We, let, help us never to forget that, that these men that you've used were just men. They were fishermen. They had other jobs. They, they were people. They were people, dear Lord. They were normal human beings, so to speak, in, in their time. They were, they were regular people. But so many of them did so many great, wonderful things for you, dear God, because they love you. Lord, we know that, that nothing can hold you back, that you still are all-powerful, dear Lord. We know that the world can be turned upside down even today. If we are not limiting you, dear Lord, if we are able to yield ourselves and yield our bodies to your will 
and offer up our bodies a living sacrifice for you to use, dear Lord, we know that you can do great things. I know it. I believe it, dear Lord. I've seen it in my life, God. I pray that you would please help our church continue to grow in our love towards you and our hatred towards the evil, dear Lord. Help us to to get the wicked sins out of our life by hating it, not wanting to have anything to do with it, dear Lord. No remnants left behind of of a sinful life. Help us to to move forward and grow closer to you, dear God. And I pray that you would please use Word of Truth Baptist Church to to turn this town upside down, dear Lord. And help us to, to do a great work in your name and to bring honor and glory unto your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.